Thank you for being here. My name is Lindsay Whitley, and I'm the director of Guilford Parent Academy. And we're so glad to see so many of you here this afternoon. Um, how many of you have ever heard of Parent Academy or Guilford Parent Academy prior to this session? Raise, raise them high, be, be proud. All right, so most of you know who we are and what we do. Guilford Parent Academy is a parent outreach arm for Guilford County Schools. And we understand that when parents are involved in the educational process of their children, that their children do better in school and ultimately in life. And so um, we're here to support you as our parents um, and our families, and we want to provide you with relevant resources so that you can help your children achieve success in the classroom and beyond. So we're so thankful that you're here with us this afternoon. And this is National Bullying Prevention Month, and so we're here to discuss a very important topic. Um, it's not just a conversation here in Guilford County Schools, it's actually a national challenge when we consider bullying and cyberbullying across the country. But we want to do our part here at GCS to support our families and provide you with relevant resources and information that you can utilize to support your children through sometimes what can be a difficult topic, which is cyberbullying. So um, today we have Shanita Evans, who is an intern with the Guilford Parent Academy office, and she's worked on this particular project. Um, the event manager for the project, and so today she is going to come. Um, she's from North Carolina A and T. Any Aggies in the room? <laughs> she's um, doing her master's in adult education, and she's almost at the finish line this December. Can we give her a round of applause? So at this time, she will come to introduce our keynote speaker. Um, at this time, can we give Miss um, Evans a round of applause? <laughs> Thank you, Lindsay. Good afternoon, everyone. As Lindsay said, my name is Shanita Evans, and I'm going to introduce our guest speaker for today. Our speaker today, Mr. Keith Davis, comes to us from Just Say Yes, Youth Equipped to Succeed. Keith Davis is a former college and professional football player that has been seen on ESPN, ABC, USA Today, and Sports Illustrated. He is also an entrepreneur as well as a motivational speaker who has spoken in 5,000 schools and corporations in over 51 countries, including Australia, India, England, Russia, Brazil, China, Japan, Zimbabwe, and South Africa. He graduated from the University of Southern California with his team's highest grade point average and a degree in business finance. While playing at USC, Keith was also the team's leading tackler and an all-conference player. He was also selected to the All-American Strength Team and played in one of the college football's biggest and most exciting games, the Rose Bowl. He has won two championship rings after college, Keith signed his professional football contract with the New York Giants. Any Giants fans in the house? Cowboys, Cowboys. <laughs> Keith was one of the strongest players on the team during the preseason. He stands six feet, one inches tall, weighs 290 pounds, and benches over 515 pounds, and leg press 1,800 pounds. Welcome, Mr. Keith Davis. Thank you. It's such a pleasure to be here with all of you. Uh, not only just to be here, but it's a pleasure to be in the big state of North Carolina. So uh, I love coming to North Carolina. First of all, uh, I come to North Carolina. I like it because you have so many colleges here. So I heard you guys cheer for A&T. Um, I have friends who actually went there. Uh, but then, you know, I do watch basketball on TV, and I know out there, so let me just get a feel. Do I have any Carolina Tar Heel fans in the house? Huh? I'm a Tar Heel fan because I like watching that Tar Heel. I like the blue. I just like the light blue. Okay? <laughs> and I'm not going to ask about um, Duke because I don't like Duke. <laughs> I'm just joking with you guys. But I'm going to move on to a little bit of football. First of all, um, 
Dude, where are my Panther fans? Any Panther fans in the house? Okay, all right, good. And uh, that, that's cool, and I understand. That's your, your home team. I mean, I know y'all got the pretty boy quarterback and all that stuff, so it's all good. <laughs> but I heard one lady over here, and I don't know where she was at. I just kind of heard an echo, and she said, I'm a Cowboy fan. Yeah. So, so for all my Cowboy fans, can I do something special for y'all today? Yeah. You know what I want to do for y'all? I want to pray for y'all. Y'all going to need some help at the end of the day, man. I know it's going good now. Giants need help too, but they're going to really need some help. You know, I'm just, just messing with you guys. When we were doing a middle school and one of the kids, I was actually with one of my buddies who actually formerly played with the Patriots, and he's very big. I mean, he's 6'8", he's 350. And we walked in and the kid, the kid said, dang, y'all big. <laughs> and he asked that famous question, you know, how did you guys get so big? Did you ever try steroids? So, uh, I got so many moms here, so I just want to give the answer. I looked at the young guy and said, man, we don't need any steroids. I said, no shortcuts. Everybody say, no shortcuts. No shortcuts. We just said, hard work pays off. And then we looked at him and we said, we've been drug tested, blood tested. Don't need any steroids, just cornbread, fried chicken, and collard greens. I got a mama that can cook. How many of y'all moms out there? I know you can cook. Got grandmas that can cook. All right, good. I love that. I'm just waiting because I want somebody to invite me for dinner tonight. <laughs> anyway, so the question really is this, um, you know, being here, why would I be here doing a bullying conference uh, for my young people who are out in the crowd? You just never know the back story that I myself was picked on and bullied. One of my great friends who speaks with us had uh, tremendous turmoil with this thing called bullying. So our goal is today is just to inspire you and, and encourage you. It's going to be okay. You're going to make it through. I call it the second half. I'll explain that in a minute. But uh, as you can tell, I am not here by myself, so I'd like to introduce my, my, my colleague that's here with me, one of my, my friends and teammates. Is that okay? Yes. So let me tell you a little bit about him. Uh, first of all, he was born in a place that all of you would rather be right now. And my moms, you might go and you might not come back. He was born in a place called Honolulu, Hawaii, okay? Woo! For all my African-American moms, you know, that's where you go and work on your suntan, okay? <laughs> Jeez, that's what you got. His father is from a tiny island in the South Pacific called the island of Samoa. It's a Polynesian island. Most people do not know this information, so I'll share this with you. Uh, they did a special on CBS News 60 Minutes, and they said um, it blew a lot of people's mind, but believe it or not, the island of Samoa, an island so small you can barely find it on the map, has more NFL players than any place in the world. Okay. Uh, if you look closely at a lot of uh, college rosters and NFL rosters, an uh, unbelievable amount of Polynesian um, young men there. I share that with you because my friend Isaac, they, they have a work ethic that you've never seen before and just the family culture. And he'll share a little bit about that. Um, a great individual. Now, uh, football-wise, he comes from a football family. All of his brothers have got Division I college football scholarships. His father was recruited by the NFL. His uncle played for the Steelers. So Isaac was a great football player, uh, dominating high school and in college, was starting nose guard. Uh, at the University of Texas, El Paso, strongest player to play there, bench pressing over 500 pounds. All that stuff is great. But academically, uh, he got a chance to do what very few students get to do. Uh, he got a chance to go where only the elite students uh, get a chance to even participate. He received his congressional recommendation to the United States Air Force Academy, where all the pilots are trained. But um, he had his struggles as well in terms of this bullying thing, and he'll tell that story in a minute. But last of all, I just want to say this. For all of my people who never watch football, many of you have still have seen him on television. He's been on TV in front of millions of people because he is a very gifted musical artist. Um, how many of you watch shows like The Voice, American Idol, and there was a show called The X Factor as well? If you were watching the last season of X Factor, you would have saw my friend Isaac on TV. The Samoan guy was singing so phenomenally that all the judges were blown away. And they all gave him a thumbs up and they said to him, you're going to Hollywood. And so he was on TV every week singing in front of 20 million people. But uh, he took time out of his busy schedule to come to North Carolina and encourage you all. Uh, He's six feet, 280 pounds, and for my young kids, you may have seen him on a very, very famous movie that 
was so famous just recently. It was a Disney movie called Moana. Some of y'all know his name. Yes, this is the real Maui. Let's give him a hand clap for Moana. Aloha. Aloha. We are uh, excited to be here. We're honored to be here. Uh, Keith said, uh, you know, that I was Maui from that movie Moana. The only I love that movie. I'm I'm grateful for uh, it portraying part of my culture. The only downside is I got about 20 little kids at my church now because my pastor told them that I was Maui from the movie Moana. So now I got 20 little kids that don't even know my real name. They just call me Maui. So, <laughs> it's the only downside. But man, we yeah yeah it, it was an excellent movie. But uh, so I got a question for you guys. Are you ready to have some fun? Yes. All right. Well, we're gonna get it started. We're gonna have a little bit of fun. Yeah. That's what yeah. Sorry. Yeah. So so our our goal is uh, to to encourage you to inspire you. And Isaac, as you know, just from the challenges that we faced in our in our life. Sometimes either as a parent, if you're dealing with a child that's having to deal with this issue, it can be trying, and, and for the young person that's trying to deal with this as well, and even for the young person that's involved in it, many times uh, we have a saying that hurt people hurt people. And they're hurting people because something's going on as well. So we want to deal with all these different issues, but Isaac, you know, uh, before we get started, um, I, I like to speak by visual aid. Uh, she mentioned very, um, succinctly a few of the countries I've spoken in. I shared this morning, I've been in countries, uh, some unique countries where I've actually had four translators speaking as I was speaking. Different languages all going at the same time. So I've learned to speak by visual aids. So all that to be said, uh, I'm going to just do a quick uh, visual aid to kind of get started and then we'll roll from there, okay? Is that good? Okay, all right, great. So uh, I'm gonna need a little bit of help to get started. So first of all, uh, Way in the back, there's a gentleman with some glasses on and that shirt, his name is Gabriel. If you could help me out, way back, you can help me out. Let's give him a hand clap, okay? And then, um, <clears throat> I'm gonna just get rolling here. There's another dad, looks like a big guy right there with a gray and black kind of sweat jacket, got a real cool ball head and hair cut right there, right there. Yeah, you can help me out just for a second. Let's give him a hand clap as well, okay? Awesome. <laughs> awesome. And then, really, really quickly, um, <laughs> There is, uh, I, I need uh, I need a little guy. I need a, like a little, yeah, little guy. Come on, help me out. Actually, both of you guys, both of y'all, come on, help me out. Good. Let's give him a hand clap, everybody. Perfect, 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 perfect. Awesome. And then there's a young lady with her phone just filming. Can I have you for like two seconds? Yeah, yeah awesome, because I like your braids. They're cool, awesome. Let's give her a hand clap, awesome, great. Okay. And then uh, she was so phenomenal in her introduction. Shanita, can you help us out one more time? Just give her a hand clap as well. Great. Awesome. Great. Now, I, I have everyone here because uh, I want to do a theme, and I have to kind of get on, um, get everybody on the same page. So, first of all, uh, I, I, before I speak, I, I like to challenge people with this in one word, and so I want you to say it with some energy and some passion for me, okay? This... One word is, it's a healer. No matter what we face and what your child is facing, whether it's elementary, junior high, or high school, and whatever type of bullying, as you know, there's several types of bullying. You have traditional bullying, and you have online bullying. You have this cyber bullying thing. You have a physical bullying. You have verbal bullying. You have social bullying. So we're gonna try to talk about all of them, but I think there is one word I found that just somehow inspires kids and rises them above all of that stuff. And it's this one word, mom and dad, I want you to say it with me and my young people as well. Everyone say the word, dream. 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 Oh, no, no, a little bit louder. Dream. Dream. Now, everyone say this with me. Everyone say choices. Choices. Voices. Voices. So I find out sometimes young people get caught up when they are involved in the bullying because they start making wrong choices because they're listening to wrong voices. And then some of the kids who are suffering it, they're getting caught up because they're listening to the wrong voice as well. So mom and dad, what I'm gonna challenge you in my first step, and actually this is the one that will be kind of thread throughout the entire program, is to begin to speak about the dream or the vision. And so I, I just wanna um, get to the visual aid, and then I'm gonna give a definition of this word. Actually, let me just define it right now. So the word uh, a vision or dream, uh, let me explain it because it's different than sight, okay? So the word, the word vision actually comes from the Greek word optica. 
which is where we get the English word for an eye doctor. He's called a optometrist. The word optica means this. It means something in a distance. It's not here yet, but I can see it. And it's coming into view. So they want to know why you won't quit, because it's coming into view. It ain't here, but I can see it. There was a blind lady. Uh, completely blind, they asked her this question, what can be worse than being completely blind? Her answer was profound. She communicated back because she was deaf as well. She said the only thing worse than being completely blind is having sight but no vision. Do you know why? Because sight can see what is but vision can see what could be. Sight is a function of your eyes, but vision, it is a function of your heart. It is that thing that I keep seeing and it doesn't go away, even when my eyes are closed. Even when people are attacking me with their words, or even their hands. Or their but I keep seeing it. They want to know why I won't quit. I know some kids get depressed and discouraged and bullied. They don't want to go to school, but you're still going. Why? Because you see it and it's coming into view. So, I'm going to come back to that as I have my volunteers here. Mom and Dad, I'm going to have a challenge for you first and then for my young people. So, first question in terms of this dream is simply this. I ask moms and dads first and then the young people simply is, what size dream did you choose this morning? First kind of dream. Let's have a little fun. Come on, buddy. Help me out for a second. How you doing, man? <laughs> Ooh, looking cool, bro. Got the fresh cut and all that stuff going on. Fresh sweats. He, I know your dream's big on the inside. My hand's bigger than half your chest. Let me get that <laughs> but he's going to be my first category. It's not your real dream. It's just category number one. Everybody say little dream. No, 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 no. I said these kids get discouraged when they have a lot of dreams to get little. Mom and dad, we can't let them have that. So anyway, I know you don't have a little dream, but you're just category number one. You stay there, okay? All right. Good job, man. Good job, buddy. Okay. All right. No losing. Stay right there. Category number two. What's up, buddy? How you doing, man? Come on over here. Oh, you category number two. Man, you got some fresh stuff up there, bro. That's some puffy stuff, man. Yeah. You got some dreads. Okay. Category number two. Everyone say average dream. Average uh, dream. No, just getting by. Mom and Dad, I'm going I'm to share with you something that I really learned. Listen, and this has to go with, with me and my sons and what somebody did with me. And, they, and, 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 the, and, it, and the saying goes just like this. It says, inspired people inspire people. So for all my parents out there, I need you every day. I need you to wake up, and I need you to get a bigger vision. So you can speak vision to your child. I can't speak what's not in me. I want them to be encouraged, but I'm not encouraged. Right? So everybody say no average dreams. So no little dream, no average dream. Sir, come on over here. This big guy right here. How you doing, sir? Everybody say big dream. All right. Now, sir, you know, uh, I had to get somebody that wasn't a kid because the big dream, it's just that long range vision and you, you're a big guy, so I appreciate you helping me out, okay? But I, I do have somebody that's actually just a little bigger because they're a little taller than you and I want everybody to reach a little bit higher, so I'll go last category. Come on up here, Gabriel. So I'm gonna actually put you and him together and we're gonna have a package deal, all right? But you both got a little facial hair, not like the kids, so you guys are gonna be called, everybody say, Big old dream. Big old dream. <laughs> Actually, I'm in Carolina, so I want the unlimited dream. So we put all three of us in a package, and this is what I want you to speak to your your, ch your children, parents. I just want to, everybody say, buffet dream. Buffet dream. Come on, so everybody say, no limits. no limits. I don't think they caught it, though. Let me get one more name. We can all stand together. Come on now, come on. I need y'all to get a vision with me now. Everybody say, golden corral. <laughs> Tell your child, I don't care what that it's all right there. You just gotta reach for it. Everybody say reach for it. Reach for it. A man looked at me in the middle of my trials, and I'll share my story in a minute. He said, Keith, you're not born a winner or a loser, you're born a chooser. 
He says, I, I want you to choose, first of all, you know, to, to keep, 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 keep your dream, keep your focus. Choose to speak up when others are being quiet. Choose not to discourage it. And, and again, I, and, and parents, I, I just want you to choose. Come on, choose the greatness for your time. So begin to speak that. So I got all my dreams. So I'm happy you stay right here. Don't move, okay? Now, ladies, thank you so much. First of all, thank you. Lincoln Hornets, right? I like your braids. They're awesome. I'm going to have you up now for a second, okay? All right. Um, we're going to be on TV. Is that okay? Okay, okay. So I'm going to have you step right here. Okay, face me. Okay, awesome. Okay. She face me right there. Okay. She needed to help me out for a second. Okay. And she's going to face you, okay? Now, ladies, we're going to do a little theme. Um, now, as we talked a little bit about dreams and, and education and everything, so now this bar is going to represent uh, great education, great future, great words, okay? Everything great I'm going to put on your shoulders, okay? All right, so here we go. Great education, great future, great dreams. You have it just a little bit. So I have everything great on your shoulders. The first thing we do with education is we hold on tight. Got some candy? Okay, good. You know me, I can spot candy. Okay. All right, I need both hands. Okay. There they go. Perfect. Hold on tight. And she need to hold on tight. Okay, great. Now, so we have all of these great things available for us. Every child has it. The problem is I'm meeting kids, and for those who don't know, uh, this is a heavy piece of steel. And I have a piece of steel for a very important reason because I meet so many students who are coming to school and they are facing bars. They are stuck. And the thing about it is, they're not stuck behind prison bars. That's right. They're stuck behind the strongest bars that we all face. The invisible bars on the inside. Bars of discouragement, depression, bars of ostracism, all, all of these things try to stop us. But what we're going to do is we're going to rise above the bars. And so ladies, what I'm going to do today is as you have your dream on your shoulders, your education on your shoulders, and all these great things for your future, just like every student in this district, I am the bully now. I am the peer pressure. I'm going to try with everything I can to say words that put you down and to steal your dream, but you hang on tight. Don't let me take it. You're almost at the end. She came in there, graduated, <laughs> December. all day. So you hold on tight, okay? Here we go. Ready? Don't ever let go of your encouragement, your aspiration, your dream. Okay, here we go. Ready? One, two. She's looking at me like, oh my God. <laughs> all right, don't let go. One, two, three. <sighs> well, you've been working out. <laughs> <laughs> here we go. Ready? One, two, three. <sighs> See, I saw, I saw Shanita on that infomercial. She was doing good with the P90X. I saw you doing that. Okay. okay, now, ladies, here we go. Mom and Dad, um, one of the things I encourage the students to do, and when I'm doing entire school assemblies, is I say, I, I want to challenge you. You know, football guys are strong and all that stuff, but I say, I want to challenge you to use your words to lift people up. And so what we're going to do today is just talk about what happens when you hold on to that encouragement. And, and when other students lift people up, because we want to talk a little bit about lifting people up. So my friend Isaac is a, an awesome friend of mine, an individual. He's going to talk a little bit about his story, lifting people up, but he's going to just do a quick visual aid about living life at a different level, okay? So what's going to happen is my friend Isaac told me, he, don't, I got it, Isaac, don't worry about it. He's going to get up under this bar and talk about lifting people up. He's going to lift both of these ladies up, literally, okay, over his head. And he told me that if the moms and dads who were out there and the young people got him really excited like he was on the field, and if they got his adrenaline really pumping, he was going to get those ladies in the air and kind of uh, spin them around like a helicopter. Are y'all ready? Are you guys ready? Everybody say, at the top. Everybody say, at the top. Say, my words, my vision, my education. Say, I'm going to the top. Let's give him a hand clap. Here we go. Okay. Let's give him a hand clap, everybody. Let's give him a hand clap. Right? 
We're gonna do one more analogy. I got my dreams here. <clears throat> We're gonna do something that we like to do in our training, okay? Uh, it'll all relate in a minute. Just bear with me, okay? I'll have a little fun as I do this. We're gonna do a little thing that we do in our training. Uh, in our training, we always do push-ups as well as lift weights. But we're going to do some push-ups, okay? Uh, you'll see in a minute, Isaac is getting in push-up position. He's going to lay flat on his stomach. He's going to try a push-up, but it's going to be a different kind of push-up. He's going to try a push-up with somebody really little standing on his back, okay? So here we go. Come on, help me out, buddy. You got to be some out. Step over on that 91. Here we go. Should he need to help me out on his elbow and wrist? Okay. All right, everybody, on the count of three, I need you to say push. Ready? One, two, three. Push. Come on, a little bit louder. One, two, three. Push. Oh, that was good. That was good. But everybody, we can't stop with the little dream. Everybody say, don't stop. Don't stop. So even if I've lifted one person up with my words, I can't stop with just one at the school. Come on, step off, buddy. Average dream, come on up here. Help me out for a second. Here you go. Come on. On the count of three, push. Ready? One, two, three. Push. Everybody say, don't stop. Don't stop. Mom and Dad, you may encourage your child, but you encourage another one. All right, here we go. Let's get to the real stuff. Come on, good guy. Good guy. Yeah. 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 together as a group. Everybody, let's spell it. P. P. U. 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 S. 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 H. H. Good, okay. Now, here we go. Each letter has a meaning. Um, I just want to get you in tune with what that means, okay? So the first letter is a big word that starts with a P, but it just means hang in there. For my parents and my young people, and my teachers, I have teachers who are tired I've been to 56 countries, actually. I tell them, no matter what language, what country, I've been to the schools in the jungles of Bolivia, all the way to the edge of the Sahara Desert in Australia, and you have one thing in common with all the other teachers. You know what that one thing you have in common? You're tired. <laughs> but we're going to hang in there. First letter, P. Everyone say it with me. Everyone say, persevere. Persevere. Until, Until success, success happens. Push. Push. Now, it's very easy to have a little clever saying like that, but what does that really mean? Persevere. I just want to say it like this. Um, I came to school with some tremendous weight on my back. And not only the voices of the other students laughing and making fun of me and picking on me, but I'm gonna just go into my house just for a minute. So my father never came to one game. My father chose drugs over me. And the drugs pulled his life down. 
When I was four years old, my own father committed suicide. My mother was so devastated in the heart of the inner city of LA, she didn't know what to do. She had no money, no hope, no nothing. So my mother just began to drink and drink and drink, and my mother became an alcoholic. And she's getting high. And to add to all of that, we cannot stay in one place more than a few months. I used to wonder why I come home from school and she said, you get your stuff, we gotta move. But, cause my mom had no money and not a lot of skills, so we'd move one place and then next thing I know they were kicking us out in another place. So that led to me, by the time I was 15 years old, I'm in my 19th different school. And you know the tremendous amount of pressure it is for a student when you go to a different school and now you know and no one. And they're laughing because your clothes are not cool, your shoes are not cool. And I'm chubby. And I wear glasses. And then I want to get a little bit deeper. Because this is why this can be so devastating. So my mom is dating another man. My father's dead. And my mother has a boyfriend and then another boyfriend. And some of you know how this goes. But now she found this one boyfriend that she thinks she's in love with. She decides that she wants to let him move in with us. And I tell students, I say, do you know what really hurts? And it's amazing how many kids can feel this pain. I said, it really hurts sometimes when you look and you see your mom treats her boyfriend better than she treats you. So now you're so sensitive to every little bit of criticism because you've got this spirit of rejection on you. My mother's boyfriend moves in with us. He lives with us for six years. And the problem is, just to be honest with you, because I don't go here a lot, is he is a big giant man with a big giant fist and he is a he he's abusive he beats my mom he hits me he hit me so hard the side of my head one time I couldn't hear for two weeks but I'm gonna give you my answer for this thing everyone actually I'm gonna, I'm gonna give you a football signal and we're, we're gonna come back to the end of that story everybody my coach would hold it up like this. Everybody hold it up like this? Do you know what this means? He said peace, it means two. I'll just roll with you. Everyone say it with me, everyone say first half. First half. Give me some energy, care a lot of energy on this next one. Everybody say second half. Second half. Little bit louder, first half. First half. Second half. Second half. Second half. So where does this signal come from? We were getting ready to play the biggest game of the year. We're walking out on the field, and there are 90,000 people in the stands. It's so loud, the stadium is vibrating. We got our helmets clicked, gloves on. It's game time. The TV cameras are in our face. We get out on the field. First series of the game, QB comes up. Blue 88, red 44, hard, hard. When this ball snaps, he drops back, we explode enough the ball, we're coming out and the QB sets up like this. But all week long, the TV announcers, the ESPN experts have predicted we were gonna get beat and get beat bad because we got an up and down season. You don't know how we are gonna play. But this team is undefeated. And some of us, our lives are like that, and yet this one seemingly has it all together, but they don't. So all of a sudden, this QB just fires away on us. Shoo, shoo, and up and down the field they go. We cannot stop them. By the end of the first half, it is horrendous. It's embarrassing. Not only are we getting beat so bad, but when you look on the scoreboard, we got a zero. I have students who wake up every morning, for whatever reason, they're feeling like a zero. And the crowd that was cheering so loud just started to make this one sound as we ran off the field at halftime up into the tunnel. They were like, boo. And every day in America and here in North Carolina and particularly in Greensboro, there are students 
who don't want to come to school because they feel like they're getting booed. And even to go deeper, some kids are getting booed in their own home. I was in Miami, a young girl came up crying and I just couldn't stop her from crying. I said, what did I say to make you cry like that? She said, you asked me about my daddy. She said, my daddy, he don't call, he don't write, he don't visit. And her cute little face, she said it like this. He treat me like I'm not even his daughter. Go ahead, go ahead, go ahead. I whispered two words in her ear to encourage her. Like I'm going to say to every kid that's getting bullied. I just whispered two words real softly in her ear. I said, second half. And I'm going to be real with you. Then I said something else to her. I looked at her and I said, don't worry about your daddy. Because you didn't come from your daddy anyway. I said, you only came through your daddy. I said, you came from God. You one of a kind. Second half. Everybody say second half. Second half. Had another little girl, Isaac and I were just last week speaking. She came up. She was sixth grade. Told me how she, she cuts herself. People pick on me all the time and this and that and she, she's showing me cuts in her leg and I told her, I said, I'm not, I'm, I said, I, I understand that. I had another good little girl, she cut the hate in her leg because she didn't like her. She was looking in the mirror feeling like a zero. And I said to her, I said, you know, out of all these countries I went to, um, I said, I would, I'll never forget my trip to France because when I was in Paris, I went to visit a little spot called the Louvre. If you are not familiar with the Louvre, the most expensive paintings in the world are in the Louvre. Can I tell you what else is in there? There is a painting in there worth $1.3 billion. That's one painting over $1,000 million for one painting. I went to see this painting. Everybody's gathered around looking and I said, is that it? <laughs> you think it's some monstrosity? And you know what the funny thing was? I told a young girl, I said, it's just a little teenage girl on there, no makeup, no hair, no earrings, no jewelry, none, no weave, no nothing. I like the weave. It looks good. If you can't grow it, then sew it. You know what I'm talking about, right? I'm just being real with y'all. Can I be real? Okay. Everybody say second half. I said, and they say the painting is worth 1.3 billion. I said, they say it's worth that much because the strokes, of the way the artists did the strokes, they were so unique. They were, here's the word, one of a kind. Mm -hmm. Do you know why you can speak to your child about vision and greatness? Because he or she is one of a kind. Do you know why, Mom, you can look in the mirror right. and inspire and encourage yourself? Because you are one of a kind. That's right, that's right, that's right. And though the words they're saying, they may be laughing at you, they don't, they don't realize that you are one of a kind. That's See, right. <laughs> something about that messaging. So let me get back to it. Everybody say second half. Second half. So when we went back in the locker room, our coach simply looked at us and said, guys, I know we can beat this team. We just got to get a new game plan for the second half. Yeah. And we came back out with a whole new plan. Mm -hmm. And this is what we're getting today, a plan. Mm -hmm. And we're going to come back, come back, come back, come back. In the last minutes of the game, running down the edge of the field, we were three-point, we came all the way back. And my buddy Eric just made this phenomenal catch. And when he pulled it in, boom, the referee just stood in the corner with the striped shirt, touchdown, the stadium erupted. Can I tell you why I told you that story? I didn't come to North Carolina to talk about football. I told you the story because we didn't win the game the first half. We won the game the second half. And there are some young people and some parents in here who've had some bad first halves. But the good news is every one of you and your children can have a great second. In the middle of all that I was dealing with, I was in the remedial class, and the kids would laugh at me. They would say, ah, Keith got to go to the dumb people class. I couldn't read well. You in 19 schools, you can't read well. That's right. And I sat there, and I, 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 I remember I was trying to do the assignment, and I, I was doing it, and I heard this sound behind me. Shh. Shh. 
And I looked behind me. And when I looked behind me, I went back to the test, and then all of a sudden I heard over here, shoo, and then I heard over here, shoo, shoo. Some kids don't even know that sound. That's the sound of everybody in the class, just shoo, to the next page. Shoo, and I'm still on the first page. And when I hear that sound, it made tears come to my eyes, because all of a sudden the bars come up. Ah, you got to go to the dog people class. I'm already chubby. I already got glasses. Mama ain't got no money. But there's a voice. Now, my mother wasn't the voice at first. There was a teacher. His name was Mr. Hutchison. He just whispered softly and said, Keith, don't quit. And he said something very powerful. He said, you don't have to be great to get started. You just got to get started to be great. He kept me going, kept me going, kept me going. <clears throat> He got my dream up. Because if you, mom or dad, ain't speaking the dream to him, other kids might be able to steal it. And I finally had the courage to look and say, Mom, I want to go to college. No one in my family had been. And when I made it to USC, I came in at the bottom. I was still struggling. But as we know, it ain't how we start, it's how we finish. And I stood on the stage. Everybody say, second half. Amen. I would hold my hands out like this. I had a suit and tie in this really immaculate place. Everybody was so uh, sophisticated and just, I was receiving the most prestigious honor they give. University of Southern Cal hands out what's called the Howard Jones Award once every year. They said this award is given to the one player with the highest overall grade point average. Academic All-American nominee, Scholar Award of Honor. Our winner tonight for the recipient of the Howard Jones Award, Mr. Keith Davis, and I walked up on the stage. I was ready to make my speech, and I had practiced, and I was ready, and I got ready to speak, and I couldn't even talk. Not because of the people or the TV cameras. I looked right in the front row, and there my mother was. She had reached the second half. No more alcohol, no more crazy boyfriend. She was looking beautiful, she had, she had tears running from underneath her glasses. She wasn't crying because I dropped out and gave up. Remember I had that voice, right? Mm -hmm. Mr. Hutchinson, that cheap that boy. She wasn't crying because I was, I had, you know, she was crying because she was proud, making noise that only my mom, and my mom was out here know how to make when you proud. <laughs> <laughs> so let's give a hand clap for all the mamas out here and all the women. Everybody say it with the second half. give you, um, how am I doing? I want to give you a quote. I was visiting the country of India and there's a man who changed that country. His name is Mahatma Gandhi. And he simply says, in order for us to find ourselves, we must first lose ourselves in the service of others. So what's happening is kids are discouraged because they can't find themselves. So I was at a school and a young girl came up to me. She says, everybody calls me stuck up, everybody this and that. And she was really interesting girl. I was in Ohio. She said to me, but I don't care what they say because they were cyberbullying her. She says, you know what? I want to be a doctor. I said, really? And she said to me, yeah. She says, because I took a trip this summer with my youth group to a country in Central America called Honduras. And she said, and all of those kids there in that home, little bit, they had no medical care, no dental care. She said, I know that when I become a doctor, I don't want just a big house and car. She said, I know I can take a, and she said, it's a whole team of medical people and we can change the entire country. Why am I sharing this with you? So there was a shift in this young girl's mind about her bullying because she found herself when she lost herself in the service of us. So many times it's me, myself, and I, my eyes are here. I was in Texas, Katy, Texas. A young kid came up to me. He's so chubby. He reminded me of me. But he, he wasn't black, he was a white kid, but he had really curly hair. So 
It was really interesting look, and he wore glasses, and he was pale skinned. He said, they've been laughing at me from first grade, second grade, but, and he told me his whole story. He said, but you know what I did? And he talked about the vision, and he said this. He said, and so I made a decision. I was going to inspire other people. He said, so I went out for the drama team. <laughs> and then he said, Mr. Davis, the lead role on the drama team is always given to a senior. He said, but I won the lead role as a freshman, and here's two tickets. I want you to come to our opening night tonight. Right. Everybody say second half. Second half. He lost his self. The last guy, uh, Clarence, who speaks with us, he said, I was on a school bus, and 15 guys beat me up. They kicked me. They beat me. They, and they tried to take my shoes on a school bus. They snatched his hat off because Clarence is not, he's 300 pounds now, but he was only 95 pounds at 13 years old. And he has a twin brother, and his twin brother couldn't do anything, and the bus driver would not stop the bus. And he said, I was suffocating. And they didn't know my father had just passed away three years before. My mom, and he was just, and they were just balled up and they were just beating him and this and that. And so there was another kid on the bus who, who stood up. And you got to understand, Clarence's school was predominantly black, but there was one white kid on the bus. And the white kid stood up and said, Stop! Because sometimes you have to support those who are being affected. This is for my young people as well. Well, you have to report it. You got to stand up. Listen, and the, and the kid says, "Stop!" But he said, "If you lay another hand on him, you got to go through me." And then they 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 mess with the kid too, and they hit him. And so the next thing you know, when the bus driver stopped, Clarence is all beat up, and and the little white kids all beat up, and they're, but him and Clarence become the best of friends. I'm going to tell you why I'm telling you this story. So then, as they're walking home, Clarence is so angry. I mean, he's fuming. He's like, I'm going to get revenge. I'm going to get revenge. You know how your child can get that emotion and you can't stop it. I'm going to get revenge. And, a, and a, his little buddy says to him, he says, you know what? I can teach you how to be the strongest man in the world. And Clarence looked at him and said, what do you mean? You just got beat up in four minutes. <laughs> and they're both 13. And his little 13-year-old friend says something pro so, so profound to him. He said to him, I can teach you how to be the strongest man in the world. And Clarence looked at him and he said, you got to forgive. You got to forgive all those guys who kicked you and beat you. He said, because if you don't forgive them, the bitterness will eat you away. What do I need to do? And you know what Clarence did? He became the strongest. He's the strongest player ever to play at Florida State University. His chest is humongous, right? But no, no, on the inside, he forgave. But well, let me tell you what happened. And his little buddy, years later, went to the Navy and this and that. Then his little buddy became the equipment manager at Florida State University. Clarence always had the dream to play football. He was, you know, he's a little bitty kid. He couldn't play. But his buddy came home one day for Christmas, whatever, and said, hey, do you know I'm the equipment manager at Florida State? Hey, he said, I know it was your dream to go there. And right now, I know you're only working at the grocery market, but you need to come down to Florida and live with my family and I. And I'll sneak you in the weight room every night. So he moved all the way to Florida. His buddy snuck him in the weight room every night at midnight. From midnight to 2 in the morning, every night. And then one day, they were having all the NFL players in their interview, so they went in at 3 in the afternoon. And by this time, Clarence is so humongous, and he's strong, right? And all the NFL players are getting interviewed by these TV stations, and Clarence is way in the corner, lifting like 500 pounds, ripping out all the TV cameras. They don't focus on the NFL players. They put the camera way in the back. And Clarence didn't know it. So when he went home that night, he said, I was getting ready to watch the 11 o'clock news, man. I sat down. He said, I had a turkey sandwich, five buffalo wings, and a glass of Kool-Aid. <laughs> he said, I turned the TV on. He said, they didn't show Deion Sanders. He said, they showed me. I said, oh my God. He said, I'm going to go to jail. <laughs> I'm trespassing. Long, long story short, what happened was that the next day he got a call from the head coach. He, he said he was so frightened. He thought he was going to jail. The head coach says to him, um, he said, he's going to walk in, he said, oh, you know, Coach, I, I didn't know this was a weight room. I thought it was a library. I, I didn't know. <laughs> long, long story short, Coach says, I've been watching you for three months on my surveillance camera. <laughs> he said, your attitude is contagious in this place. 
all of my other team are doing what you're doing. They're working harder than I've ever seen before. He said, I want you on my team. When the last time you played football class, looked at him and said, seventh grade? Mm-hmm. Coach said, I want you on the team. Coach gave him $100,000 scholarship. Mm-hmm. He goes to Florida State, wins a national championship, plays for well, Everybody say second half. Second half. Everybody say yeah. forgive. forgive. Come on, come on. We're, we're talking about, come on, some vision, some partisan. From bullying to inspiring. Mm-hmm. Now, I don't want my time to run out, so Isaac, come up here for a second. Uh, what you don't know about Isaac is that Isaac's dad, I know his dad well. His dad is from the island of Samoa, but his dad came to America, had a tough time learning English language. But one thing his dad said to Isaac is, you, 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 you got an opportunity. So Isaac worked really, really, really hard in the classroom and did something that no other Tawa Effa did. His last name is Tawa Effa, Polynesian name. No other Tawa Effa has done this. Isaac walked, walked across the stage at the university, shook the hand of the president of the university, and the president of the university placed in his hand something he worked extremely hard for, a college degree. And it said, Isaac Tower Apple. And in parentheses, it said, bow. <laughs> and I say second half. He worked hard on the field and won all that. But what you don't know is the story, listen. <laughs> he faced some bullying issues on that path to success. And I'll let him share that, and then the last part about his TV show auditioning, singing on those TV shows, which is crazy, and we'll close it up. Let's give it up to my friend, Mr. Isaac Howell. Uh, so I, I just wanted to share a little story about uh, when a few times that I, I got bullied in my life uh, started. There was a few times when I was a younger kid when I first moved from uh, Texas to Hawaii, and uh, you know, I have a unique last name, Tawaefa. Uh, and I moved to a smaller town in Texas, and there was a lot, I mean, I had a lot of great friends, but there were a lot of kids who had never heard a name like that before, and so they loved to mispronounce it and come up with different versions of it because like, they got a rise out of me, and it would frustrate me, and uh, I didn't like it, you know, but they liked to, they liked to pick on me because they got a rise out of me being frustrated with the mispronunciations. But um, uh, at times when I really faced uh, some some serious bullying and, and where I really got my experience in understanding how people feel how, how some of these kids feel these days when it comes to being bullied uh, happened when I was in high school uh, when I was just getting to high school I was an eighth grader I uh, just gra- I just graduated eighth grade going into my freshman year and some of the varsity coaches had been keeping an eye on me and they wanted me to to come out and to work out with the varsity football team well some of the older guys who have been working really hard uh, to get a spot on the varsity for four years they didn't like that an eighth grader was coming in uh, and getting an opportunity that they didn't get before. So some of them weren't really nice to me. They were, they were really unkind. But uh, throughout, the, throughout the workouts, throughout the practices, it started to get, it started to get uh, meaner and meaner and uh, starting to say more hurtful and hurtful things. And uh, you know, I had some thick skin. And I, had, I was a pretty popular kid in eighth grade. So you know, I was coming in with that, uh, just having a big group of friends and feeling supported. And, then I come into this environment where I don't have any of my friends with me. I'm, I'm back, starting back at the bottom of school again. Nobody knows who I am, and now these older kids are, are teasing me and putting me down, and, and they're doing everything they can. They're saying everything they can to get through, to try to hurt me, uh, because they didn't like me. They didn't even know me, but they didn't like me. I mean, I remember you know, missing my shoes and you know, them uh, talking about me. I couldn't hear what they were saying, but I know they're talking about me because they're pointing at me and they're laughing. You know, and it's like so frustrating. But I would get in the car after practice, and my dad could tell something was wrong, and he would ask me, you know, what's wrong? And uh, I would just say, nothing. You know, practice was hard. Lifting was hard. I'd get in the car again, hey, what's wrong? What's going on with you? You all right? And I'd talk to him. I'd just say, yeah, yeah, I'm fine. I'm fine. No, nothing's going on. And I meet a lot of students who feel the same exact way. They're, they're, they're afraid to speak out against bullying. They're afraid to say something because, you know, I, I know, I know how, it, how it feels to say, I should be strong enough mentally and physically to, to protect myself. Uh, I shouldn't have to go crying to my mom or my dad or my teachers about bullying, but they don't understand that, that those people are in place just to help you. Because bullying is more, it's not only just detrimental to your social development and your social interactions, it's also a distraction from keeping you from reaching your goals and your potential. It's, it's a, it, it holds you down. And so uh, if I would have realized sooner that my dad and that my teachers and my coaches, they're there to help me, 
uh, it would have been resolved a lot earlier. Well, one day it was particularly bad. Uh, I remember being really frustrated and, and I was I was really angry because I wanted to say something. But you know, when you're 13, you're 13 years old and you're coming in and there's some 18 year olds on the team. I don't know how you felt when you were in high school, but when I was a freshman, I used to think that those, those dudes were grown men. I mean, some of them had beards. <laughs> And looking back, they probably didn't really have a beer, but I thought they did when I was 13, you know. You look at them and you think, man, you know, I don't want to mess with them. That's, that's, like, that's an adult. Uh, and so when they're teasing you and they're putting you down, and, and it's like you don't, it's a brand new experience. You don't know how to react. It's like, you know, a parent saying something to you. Like you just, you're not used to it, you know. And so I remember being so frustrated, and I wanted to say something back, but I was, I was intimidated, and I just kept to myself, and I didn't want to get in a fight and get in trouble, so I was kind of caught in this. Uh, dilemma. So I was really frustrated, but I remember I left that day, and I was so frustrated. I got in the car, and my dad was asking me what was going on, and he kept prying and prying because he could tell. He's my dad. He knows, he knows me, you know, and he just kept asking because he knew there was something there, and he was prying and prying. Finally, I was just so frustrated that he was asking me, frustrated about the situation. I started tearing up, started crying, and so I just told him, yeah, yeah, there's there somebody that's picking on me. And he's like, what? You know, so we just started talking to him, like, explaining what's well what, well, what are they doing? Well, what are they saying? You know, and he's just trying to encourage me and build me up. Well, if I would have realized there, I mean, what, what happened was my dad was able to take some steps to uh, preventing it from happening again. So he was able to, uh, to take a step toward getting me in a place where uh, that wasn't distracting me anymore, that wasn't holding me back. And so the next time I saw him, you know, it wasn't like that anymore. It was like he got talked to by some coaches and stuff like that. And it wasn't the, the feeling I thought that was going to happen. I was going to walk into this place and my coaches were going to be like, yeah, you know, uh, I'd treat me like a tattletale or something like that. But that, that's the thing that a lot of students are afraid of. They want to look they don't want to look like, uh, you know, they just ran off and cried to somebody. But the, and the, but the truth is, I had to realize later, my coaches, my teachers, my parents, they only wanted the best for me. They only wanted me to develop and to grow. And so, uh, so I tell you that story because I have, a, I have a challenge and encouragement for my students that are here today. I want you to take a step today toward sharing how you feel about if you're being bullied. Don't be afraid to talk to your parents. Don't be afraid to talk to somebody. Some things have, we meet kids all over the nation. Keith and I just got, we went to uh, Virginia. We've been to all, we were just in a, a bunch of different states and I've met students all over and they're the same. I get messages in my social media, and they say, I was going to commit suicide, and you came to my school. I, 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 was, I was so depressed. I'm on these med medications. I'm doing this. I'm doing this. I drink sometimes because it helps kill my pain, because, and it's all because of bullying. And my advice always to them first is, have you talked to anybody? Have you told your school counselor? Have you talked to your parents? Have you talked to your principal, have you talked to a pastor or a friend or family friend, anybody, there's always somebody out there that cares about you and loves you and wants to help you. So, uh, so my challenge for my administrators, my teachers, my parents here today, I, want, I, I hope that we can be a community that upholds and supports these students. Uh, it, it, sometimes it's, it's, they got to be brave and got to speak up, might look weird socially around their friends if they're talking about bullying, but you know, it's something that a lot of kids go through, and I, I hope that we can take a step toward being approachable and toward being uh, receptive and, uh, and aware of what's going on with our students. So, uh, and, and, and something else that my dad told me, my dad always taught me how to physically defend myself, how to verbally defend myself, but the most important thing my dad uh, told me was, and Keith mentioned it earlier, uh, but you know, inspired people inspire people, but the opposite is true, hurt people hurt people. And so I know that as, once I started realizing that some of these bullies were the reason why they're, they're so hateful, why they use their words to, to push people down and to hurt them is because they're hurt themselves. And once I started to realize that, I started to, instead of looking at this person with, with, uh, with hatred or with resentment, I started to look at them with compassion and started to understand that when they're, when they're doing that to me, it's just an amplification and a projection of the pain that they're feeling. And so it made, it made it a lot easier to let the, the comments and, and, and the hatred roll off of me. That's right. But uh, I have a story that I share with some students about uh, feeling paralyzed. Sometimes it's difficult to take that first step in talking to an adult, talking to a teacher. Um, and uh, I just make the analogy about uh, when I auditioned for that TV show. 
And as you can imagine, you know, there were thousands of people. I showed up to this Coliseum to go audition, and I never did anything like it in my life before. I never sang in front of that many people. I grew up loving to sing with my family. I sang uh, in the choir at school, um, the choir at my church, but I never sang by myself in front of thousands of people. But after I was the first one to graduate my family, I started realizing there was so much more out there. There was so much potential that I wasn't reaching for yet. So I said, well, you know, what can happen? Let's see, let's see what happens if I go audition. So I went out, waited in line with thousands of people, and I'm standing on the side of this gigantic stage. We wait for hours and hours, and we're moving closer and closer to the stage, and finally, it's about my turn to sing. And there was a girl who went out there and sang, and she was telling everybody all day in line how she was gonna be the best singer, and we might as well just go home and turn around now. And she wasn't very good. So uh, she came to the side of the stage, and I, I, now, mind you, I'm standing behind this 50-foot-tall curtain in the dark, and I'm looking out there at her, and she just gets kicked off on national TV, comes to the side of the stage with a microphone, says, good luck. I get that microphone, and it hit me. I was paralyzed with fear. I was so nervous. I was so scared. I, I, I felt comfortable behind that, that big curtain, because I knew if I was standing in the shadow, if I was in the dark, there was no possibility of anything bad happening to me. I wouldn't get made fun of. No one would be laughing at me. I, nothing, nothing could happen. And that's true. Nothing bad could happen if I was behind that curtain. Mm -hmm. But also nothing great could happen right. if I was behind that curtain. Right. No, no dreams could be realized. No, no potential could be, uh, could be achieved if I was just behind the curtain. So I decided that day to take a step. Everybody say, take a step. Take a step. I'm standing on the side of the stage, and, and, and I'm working up the courage to take a step. And what helped me, and, and uh, you know, something, something Keith mentioned earlier says, says we make the right choices by listening to the right voices. Right. And so there were two voices that encouraged me. One, that, that voice, uh, I think my parents, my coaches, everybody instilled in me that I had what it took, that I could make it. So it was that inner voice, but also it was the voice of my support. It was the voice of the people around me that cared about me. And that day I brought my brother with me and he was standing backstage and he was looking up at me. I turned around, you know, and he, he, he probably thinks I was turning around to get some encouragement from him, but I actually was turning around because I was about to walk off and leave the stage. I felt like leaving, but he looked at me and he said, I believe in you, man, I love you, you're gonna do great. So I felt encouraged, I felt inspired. And there's a quote about education. It says, uh, it, it says education is not the filling of a bucket, but the lighting of a fire. Mm -hmm. I wanna apply that to, do you, know that, do you know that inspiration is the same? Do you know that encouragement is the same? Encouragement is not the filling of a bucket. You don't, just, you don't just give someone a little bit and it dissipates or it spills out. You, you light a fire in someone and that fire can, is contagious and it grows and it spreads. And so that fire was lit in me and I took that first step onto the stage. I was encouraged and I kept walking and I kept walking and when I looked up, I saw 5,000 people staring at me. And sitting right in front of me was Simon Cowell and Kelly Rowland and Paulina Rubio and Demi Lovato. I looked in the back of the stadium, and it made me really nervous when I saw in the back of the stadium there was a camera. And they said, this camera's broadcasting all over the world. So that meant that they were broadcasting my beautiful face. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know why y'all are laughing. To 20, to 20 million people around the world, they were seeing me. And man, my microphone was shaking, my knees were shaking. And uh, I closed my eyes and I started singing. And you know, I, like I was, I was just a couple notes in, and, and a couple words in, and I was so nervous, and man, I, you know, I was battling with myself, man, do I have what it takes, I don't know. And all of a sudden, something causes me to open my eyes, because there's just a roar. There's a roar that's drowning out my voice. And I open my eyes, and that roar is the, is the applause of 5,000 people in the stadium. And they're standing and they're cheering and they're clapping and they're excited for me and the judges are excited for me and they give me a thumbs up and they said, hey, we're sending you to Hollywood. So they put me on an airplane, they flew me to Hollywood, picked me up in a fancy car. I got to eat all this good food. I cruised around Beverly Hills, stayed in a nice hotel with a beautiful view. And I got to eat all this good food. And I got to meet all these celebrities and chill. Man, it was awesome. I got to be on the show for a while. I uh, made it to the top 10 in my category. And I got to eat all this good food. <laughs> yeah, that was the best part for sure. But uh, you know, I didn't, come to your, I didn't come here all the way to North Carolina just to tell you all the story about me uh, so I could say, 
look at me, look what I've done. I, I came solely to encourage you, to inspire you today, uh, not to feel, fill your bucket, but to light a fire in you today and to encourage you uh, to take a step. So my parents, my educators, my administrators, I encourage you today to take a step. Be approachable for your kids. Be inspirational. Be encouraging. If you, if you light that fire in them, there's no room for discouragement. I mean, they're untouchable. And so for my students, the same for you. I want to take a step toward resolving these issues, towards being brave, and to also being encouraged and inspired so that you can't be touched either. Thank you guys so much. Okay, so our time is up, Isaac. Let's do something really, really special uh, as we have brought some young people here that are true champions. So I have something on my hands that I don't wear very often. I have both of my championship rings. Uh, they have a lot of diamonds and gold, my name, my number, the stadium. And for those who face bullying and those who are overcoming it, and even those who've in the past been involved in it. You know, there was a study by the um, American Academy of Pediatrics, and they basically said a couple of things. First of all, they said that um, 25 to 30% of kids have faced bullying, but not traditional bullying, cyberbullying. And so I'm sharing that because mom and dad, I, I'm gonna encourage you, and I know time is up, but listen, be very, very, very aware of what's going on on your child's phone and their computer. I know some of you guys just let them do their thing, but if you're just very, very aware of that. And then number two, they said 95% of the cyberbullying started off as a joke. Yeah. Are we just joking? And then it goes deeper and then really hurtful. So uh, if uh, make sure your child is not the one doing it, quote unquote, a joke, because it's not a joke. That's right. mm -hmm. And then last of all, the children who are bullying, they found that through studies that most of the time, those kids are the ones that get more involved in crime, more involved in alcoholism, and even later on in life, uh, uh, spousal abuse. So we want to make sure every young person is a true champion. Everybody say champions. champions. Second half. Second Okay, so our time is up, let's do this. I have both of these championship rings. As you know, you can't buy these, you gotta win them. Isaac has one of his rings. So what we're gonna do is close it out today with something real special. I wanna let one young person wear all three of these gigantic gold and diamond championship rings. I need a volunteer to wanna wear these rings real quick. Okay, I got kids all over the place now. I wanna know what I wanna do, man. Oh, man. Actually, uh, my, my, my young guy with the glasses on over there, come up here, man, help me out, man. I saw you when we were eating. What, what, what's your name, buddy? What is it? Good to meet you, man. Now, how old are you? How old is he? 12. 12? Good. Stand right here then. I got something real cool for you, okay? We're going to put some rings on you, all right? But before I put the rings on you, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to make you a member of my team, okay? I got something very expensive that only the players get, okay? Everybody say this with me. Everybody say official. Championship, Championship. NCAA. NCAA, Rose Bowl. Rose Bowl. Now, y'all win these basketball championships in Carolina, but as you know, the football national championship is very hard to win. You cannot lose one game. And what I have is an official Rose Bowl championship jersey. We got a chance to play this game twice. And it's very, very hard to get to those big games like that. But this is an official Rose Bowl jersey, but not just a regular one. It is an authentic throwback jersey. Only the players get these. This is an official retro throwback. He's going to be a part of the team. Let's give him a hand clap, everybody. Right? Here we go, here we go, here we go, here we go. All right, here we go. Slide that on you. Okay, I'm going to try to mess your glasses up. Oh, buddy. Okay. Put your arms in. Put that one here. It's gonna be a little bit long. Here we go, buddy. All right, there you go. That's looking good on you, man. Nice roses. It's good, okay? Now, hold your hand just like that. Real straight, okay? Go. Big diamonds, okay? Big diamonds we're gonna put on your hand. Now, I gotta, I'm gonna ask you a favor. When you get this on your hands, don't get any ideas, because if you try to run, we're gonna catch you, buddy, okay? Oh, right, here we go. Let's have a little fun. Here we go. Big diamonds, boom. This one's even bigger. Boom, and then when I'm speaking to my high schools, I tell all my high school girls, I say, remember, you never say I do to a guy until they give you a ring that big, okay? Because I tell all my girls, you're a queen. I told my wife, I have them, I say, you know, I treat my wife like a queen. She was my girlfriend, my sons. I treat young ladies like queens. I don't like seeing young ladies getting bullied for their bodies as well. No, no, no. So here we go, champ, here we go. While you fist up real tight like that, everybody say, bling, bling. Bling, bling. You hold it right there. Don't let it move, okay? Now, I'm going to have you do me a favor. I want you to take this other hand, 
And let's put this number one sign up just like this, okay? Yeah, there you go. go. Hold it up high. Our coach would do this. He'd say, one, two, three. And we would say, I am a champion. So everybody, we're going to close it out like this here in Carolina because you are unique and one of a kind and unbelievable, unique strokes created you. So everybody hold up your number one sign like this. I want to say one, two, three, and as loud as we can, like one team. This is why we wore the jerseys today, teamwork, moms, dads, administrators. I'm a champion. Hold it up real high. Okay, take one peek at your number one sign, because I don't know if the Carolina Panthers are going to be holding that up again for a long time. Okay. All right, on the count of three, I'm a champion. Ready? One, two, three. I'm a champion. One, two, three. I'm a champion. And then let's give a true champion, Mr. Whitley. Thank you so much for bringing me out to be here with you all. You are awesome. Thank you, mom, dads. Uh, it's been such a pleasure being here with you, okay? Thank you so much. God bless you.